So I want to remind um, the candidates that all viewers and participants must keep microphones muted except for the moderator and the timekeeper and the, ca and the candidate that's currently speaking. Candidates and their campaign shall not use the chat to answer questions. There'll be no personal attacks, please. This forum is a debate. Please stick to policy positions and be respectful of the moderator and timekeeper, please. Um, our timekeeper tonight, um, John, will be letting you know is John on? Um, he'll be letting you know um, by sound when your one minute is up. So you have one minute to answer each question. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Got kicked out somehow. Okay, Anissa, I just read the rules, but I haven't talked about the timekeeper. So if you could continue from there. Perfect. Um, our timekeeper is John Davis from the Keystone Neighborhood Association. We're giving the candidate one minute to answer each question and we're going to um, give them to you on a rotating basis. So each person will get to answer a question first and also last. Um, when you have 20 seconds left, you, were, you will hear one bell. John, do you wanna demonstrate that? Maybe. Okay, we'll come back to that. You'll hear one ding when you have 20 seconds left, and then you will ha hear three bells when you have um, used all of your time. If you exceed your time limit by more than five seconds, we will go ahead and mute you just to keep us on track. Larkin is our Zoom host tonight, and he is staying in control of the meter. Um, we've prepared six questions tonight, and at the end of the six questions, Jordan Gawi from the Beacon Hill Neighborhood Association will select three questions um, from the community to answer that may have been submitted through chat during the forum. So I'd like to get started with a short intro from each of the candidates. If um, I may, gonna... let me demonstrate the bell. Uh, this will be the, the 22nd warning, and this will be the ending warning following which we will mute you if you continue to speak. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to let everyone know uh, we had previously confirmed all six, but uh, Cindy Dominguez did let us know she was not able to attend tonight due, uh, due to an unforeseen um, situation. Uh, she did send her apologies. Um, so I would like to allow the candidates to introduce themselves. We're gonna go in alphabetical order. Um, please limit it to about two minutes, and we'll start with Mario. Bravo. Hello, everybody. My name is Mario Bravo. Thank you very much for having me here this evening. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to hear from you about directly about your issues. Um, I moved to San Antonio in the third grade and grew up here. I've been a community advocate and energy professional. And I'm running right now because I believe that our current leadership has shut out the voices that we need the most um, to, to be able to um, solve the problems that we have and address our greatest challenges. Um, I think we've neglected opportunities to hold CPS energy accountable. And I think that strong communities depend on leaders who listen and collaborate. Coll listen and collaborate with you, but also collaborate with their colleagues at City Hall in order to get to six votes, in order to pass policy, and in, in order to implement policy as well. So I'm really interested in bringing everybody to the table, uh, lifting up all voices, building consensus. I think that makes us stronger together. And uh, I really look forward to being able to work with you on uh, all of the issues that are most important to the community. I feel like um, anytime I sit at the table with, with several other members of the community, you know, my ideas are, are never gonna emerge as the best ideas. My ideas are just here. Um, until a better idea comes along. And when I sit down and I listen to you, I know that, you know, you through your experiences, you've seen a, lo a lot about what's going on exactly in your neighborhood and you know what best works in your neighborhood. So thank you everybody. And uh, I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Um, was Mr. Bustamante able to join? Um, Mr. Gauna, please introduce yourself. 
Hello, uh, my name is Matthew J. Gauna. I am a former student of UTSA uh, running for District 1. Uh, I hope to accomplish in our upcoming term uh, a lot of environmental reform within city departments, uh, increase and expansion of public transportation uh, in years to come, and affordable housing. Uh, for uh, future residents and more, uh, perhaps more importantly, our current residents who feel they're getting uh, priced out of their homes with property taxes and, and, and the such. Uh, uh, we, we hope to accomplish, uh, you know, uh, a ton here tonight, uh, get, get the word out to people about uh, what our campaign is really about and uh, that's putting uh, the public back into public utilities, uh, you know, reining in saws and CPS energy and looking out for the working class in San Antonio. So, uh, you know, uh, I thank you again for letting me join uh, tonight and uh, excited to uh, for this forum. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, let's hear from our current councilman, Roberto Trevino. Uh, thank you, Anissa. Thank you, Tier 1 Neighborhood Coalition. Uh, I am Roberto Trevino, your city councilman for District 1. I've been in this role for six and a half years. I uh, look forward to uh, serving a fourth term as your city councilman. Uh, as you know, we've worked alongside you the whole way. We've fought for neighborhoods, for, for people, we have worked together to, to ensure that your voices are being heard. Uh, we work together on many different plans to make sure that the neighborhood plans uh, are, are the kinds of things that, that are upheld in our city, that are, that are valued. Uh, and we know that uh, sometimes uh, city staff needs to be held accountable and uh, we are there to speak for you. We've written 35 CCRs, that's 140 times or 140 signatures that council members have signed off on policy that we have proposed. We're super proud of everything that we've done. Also, uh, as you know, I have an amazing staff, uh, a staff that you all work with, a staff that helps to make sure that we're at every meeting possible. Uh, There's so many things going on in district one and we wanna make sure that we're always there uh, speaking for you on your behalf. Thank you. All right, thank you candidates. Um, we're gonna go, get, go ahead and get started with our first question. Um, this question addresses the topic of homelessness. Since this fall, the city of San Antonio has spent approximately $189,000 on clearing homeless camps, scattering communities, throwing away belongings and dehumanizing our most vulnerable citizens. If elected, what will you do to ensure the safety and security of all of our citizens? I would like Mario Bravo to answer this question first. Thank you. Very much. Um, I want to start off by saying that, you know, I agree with our current council member that uh, we need a housing first policy. And I agree that homelessness is not a crime. Um, I think maybe where we differ is I'm committed to working with you on, on working together on, on this challenge. Um, I think that we, we work best when we're not trying to solve this issue all by ourselves and that we're, we're coordinating all the service providers, all the professionals, whether they work in mental health issues or drug addiction or direct services to people experiencing homelessness, we need to bring them all together make sure they're all coordinating, make sure that everybody's communicating to make sure that we're, you know, find out where the gaps are, find out where we're duplicating efforts. So everyone's rowing in the, in the same direction. And we're being efficient. Um, you know, our, our homeless uh, strategic plan uh, informed us that a, that patchwork of pilot projects is ineffective. And uh, if you look at our annual point in time count, you can see that that's the case. Our, our the number of people experiencing homelessness in San Antonio has gone up. Um, and I'm not even talking about, um, during the pandemic, we haven't counted during the pandemic, it's, it's skyrocketed now. Um, so I don't understand how anybody could ask for a fifth chance to try to get this right. Uh, I'm committed to following the strategic plan, but expediting the implementation of it. I think we need to do it faster. And we do that by coordinating with you and with all of the professionals who work in this space. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Mr. Yana, the same question. Yes, uh, again, homelessness uh, is an issue that is caused by uh, a myriad of uh, other societal issues, uh, you know, uh, lack of uh, affordable housing, uh, lack of uh, access to mental health uh, care and uh, involvement with, uh, you know, the criminal justice system that leaves people uh, out on the streets with nowhere to turn, uh, but, uh, you know, our city uh, sidewalk. So uh, we want to work with residents to come up with solutions and then implement those solutions. Uh, you know, as a resident of uh, San Antonio for 23 years, uh, you know, I, I've first, I've seen the problem firsthand, you know, uh, living in the district uh, from when, uh, you know, there wasn't, uh, you know, a uh, strip mall located uh, n uh, next to the, uh, the the Delview area, uh, you know, there were still, there was still a uh, uh, issue with the homeless, uh, you know, problem. And again, that's uh, not on any uh, city council member for, uh, you know, causing, but there is, uh, there is uh, the, the accountability that needs to be taken into account uh, when a, a issue such as this hasn't been solved with accessible uh, housing, you know, aff affordability and uh, uh, really, you know, bringing the uh, bringing in the urban sprawl of San Antonio and bringing resources back into uh, District One. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Trevino. Thank you, Anita. Well, the first step is to, to stop criminalizing homelessness. Uh, this is, uh, these are people in crises and uh, we, we must do everything that we can to meet them where they are. Uh, let me talk about some things that we've already done that have been tremendous. Uh, we, uh, this last year included uh, in, the, in the last budget, uh, outreach specialists for every district council office. That was unanimously adopted. That's 11 uh, outreach specialists, two in district one, because we have downtown. And the point of that is to make sure that we have the outreach, we have the social workers leading the way. Uh, this is something that has never been done before. And we led on that. Uh, we, we need to improve the, the, the number of detox facilities, the mental health services that are available. Uh, additionally, along with adopting the 11 outreach specialists that we proposed in the budget this last year, we also expanded our ID recovery program. Uh, the ID recovery program was initially started by uh, two bike patrol, bike patrol officers, which we're very proud of. However, it's only one day out of the week, which presented a problem for folks who maybe they showed up an hour late or didn't know what day it was. And we've expanded it to, to five days out of the week by expanding it over to the city clerk's office. The city clerk does birth certificates, does passports. And this is a way to understand how the city works and that we have resources that just haven't connected. We're connecting those dots to make sure that, that we're providing those services and help that, that is needed. Ultimately, we need to adopt a housing first policy. Today, we, we supported through our TERS, inner city TERS, a, a, a private development over on the east side, which is gonna be the first housing first project, uh, it's, uh, I think it's 280 homes, tiny homes uh, that are going to be produced. And that is a great step in the right direction. But the city needs to adopt a housing first strategy. We've got to stop uh, criminalizing homelessness, let the social outreach specialists lead the way. And we partner with everyone to make sure that we're meeting people where their needs are. Thank you. Thank you. Two major events in the last year have shown how much the city is relying on social media and email for communication, COVID-19 vaccination appointments and during winter storm Yuri. Increasingly, people are turning to the internet to share critical information and updates. Unfortunately, many of our senior citizens in District 1 
have access to these methods of communication, and during the storm, we're left quite literally in the dark. If elected, what will you do as our council person to ensure that our senior citizens get critical information and services during emergency situations? I would like Mr. Giana to answer this first. Thank you. Uh, to ensure that our uh, elderly population has the information during uh, emergencies. Uh, again, uh, when we provide, when the city provides information online, uh, when you, I've talked to, uh, you know, residents in uh, our community who say they, you know, don't know how to use a, com uh, a computer. So, you know, or have, you know, incredible difficulty with, using technology. So, uh, you know, was there a way to, you know, physically provide information when uh, electricity was out, uh, landlines were out, uh, you know, uh, maybe perhaps through uh, our city's uh, emergency uh, phone system, you know, we could send out alerts uh, that, you know, our residents receive on their phones. Uh, with uh, information for the to who to contact and the nearest uh, warming center and, and such uh, but you know those steps were not taken uh, you know and you know perhaps uh, you know we need a city council person who will work proactively to ensure that when uh, disasters do strike San Antonio, whether they be natural disasters, uh, man-made disasters uh, or such, uh, that we have the capacity uh, to reach all of uh, San Antonians, uh, you know, not just our, uh, you know, our, our most vulnerable, but, you know, other, other people, I, I'd, I'd never received a, any uh, warning either. So, uh, you know, it would have been reassuring to have gotten information uh, during that emergency. So we, we would look to, uh, you know, phone, phone capabilities and such. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Councilman Trevino. Thank you again, Anissa. Um, again, this is very similar to what we just talked about is we need to meet people where their needs are at. And uh, we know that senior re resources can range from transportation to wellness support, food, housing assistance, healthcare, transportation. And uh, during this storm, it only proved that, that it was very, very problematic for all of us. Communication throughout the pandemic has been heavily focused on utilizing social media and digital communication to relay any updates and resources, but not all seniors are on social media or have email addresses. NARA seniors will know how to enroll in services online through web applications. Meeting every resident where they're at means sharing information in a way that will reach them by phone, mail, or in-person outreach. Now, this is the most important part here. What I learned during the, during the emergency was working with the neighborhoods. Uh, the, the partnership that, that we saw District 1 and the neighborhoods to, to work together and make sure that we were meeting people uh, where they're at it was so, so incredible. It was very touching. Additionally, we also need to ensure that when communication with our older residents, we consider language barriers. I push for all communications to be available in Spanish as well as English. It is important that we make communication inclusive to everyone and remove barriers like language, especially for our seniors. Thank you, Mr. Bravo. Thank you. So I actually, I have, uh, my parents are senior citizens and um, so during the pandemic, one of my top priorities has been making sure that I'm protecting my parents, making sure that I'm assisting them uh, in these challenging processes of getting vaccinated. Um, same thing, you know, during the storm when we went without electricity, you know, my number one priority was making sure that my parents were okay. Um, and so I, I can appreciate this. Um, and, you know, there, there's, there's two aspects. This is, what do we do during an emergency situation? What protocols do we have in place? Clearly, we don't have good enough protocols in place for how do we do outreach beyond just digital outreach? Um, and the second is, what about day to day with seniors? Uh, what se the needs of seniors, right? Um, you know, right now we're taxing seniors out of their homes. 
And then we're trying to figure out how do we get how do we get to them so that we can we can deliver meals to them? How do we get to them so we can make sure that they're getting the health care they need? How do we get to them to make sure that they're getting their medication? And for me, that's the definition of broken government. Um, you know, we've got, you know, we've we haven't made any progress on where we're at right now in terms of um, we haven't our taxes are out of control and we haven't made progress on, on alleviating the skyrocketing property taxes. And so I think that what we need to really do is I would support reaching out to senior citizens and going door to door or using trust, trusted messengers to approach them and find them when they, I guess when people are 64 years old, just before they turn 65 and help them appeal the property taxes so they can bring them down to a lower level, make sure that they have the homestead exemption, make sure that they they, they notify BCAM that they're a senior citizen so we can lock in their property taxes at a lower level because that is gonna be meaningful for the rest of their lives while they're on a fixed income. Um, and so we can't continue to do this the way we are and it's gonna take personalized outreach and I'm committed to doing that. Thank you. Um, at this time, I want to just take a minute. I see that we've had several people join the Zoom since we began. Um, if you've recently joined, please make sure you mute your microphone, um, whether you are on video or just audio through your phone. Additionally, I want to remind all of the participants that we are collecting questions in the chat. So if you have questions for the candidate, please go ahead and type them in the chat. Um, and if we have time at the end, we will hopefully get to them. The next question for the candidates I have um, is about displacement. Studies are showing that District 1 residents, homeowners and renters are being displaced because of property speculation and investment in the market in market rate developments that are leading to exponential jumps in property tax appraisals and home prices. How will you help prevent displacement of homeowners and renters in our neighborhoods if you are elected to be our council person? Um, I believe it is Councilman Trevino's turn to begin. Thank you, Anissa. Um, well, you know, I'm, I'm very happy to, to hear this question because for the longest time, this is a section that has long been ignored. Half of our city rents and uh, there are very little protections for our renters. Uh, this past week, we adopted a, a permanent uh, a program called Right to Counsel. Uh, the Right to Counsel program uh, has protected nine out of 10 people who utilized the program and kept them in their homes. Uh, we have an impending uh, or uh, a, a, an eviction crisis that, that may uh, be upon us here very soon uh, once the moratorium is over, uh, unless it's extended. Uh, having the Right to Counsel program has proven to be so successful. We've also uh, been pushing for things like a renter's commission to help talk about uh, some of the issues that, that are surrounding uh, renters and how uh, you know this is a, a very important subject, especially in the inner city. Uh, one of my first CCRs was to revamp the building standards board to make sure that we protect existing housing. Uh, the most affordable housing is existing housing that we have and the building standards board is, is a, a critical spot to do that. I also sit on the appraisal district board as the chair and have brought many folks to, uh, to, to many property tax forums to, to understand how to protest their taxes, to understand how the appraisal system works. And uh, we'll always be working hard, hand in hand with uh, Chief Amesquita to help educate folks about their rights, help educate folks about how we have to understand uh, what we can do to, to help people uh, with property taxes. When it comes to renters or, or, or uh, uh, investment properties, it's very difficult because there's no protections we know that the state legislature is working on things that potentially can help with uh, with rental properties. We have extended other protections as well, and we'll continue to do so. My office is working hand in hand with many housing advocates to make sure that we are protecting uh, renters, which uh, are mostly co uh, cost burden when it comes to their income. And so, uh, you know, those are the um. It looks like that was the end of your time. I did not hear the bells, John. Um, can we just double check, like do a quick sound check on that? They were super. Yeah, that's super, super quiet. Is there any way to? Okay. That's better. Thank you. Hey, and Anissa, I was just informed.
informed that the 210-777-7755 number is council candidates Laurel Bustamante. So he has joined. He had some technical issues with uh, joining the Zoom via, via video. Okay, great. Um, thank you for joining Mr. Bustamante. Uh, did you hear our last question? And we're having trouble hearing you. Is have it looks like you're unmuted, but we're not hearing any sound. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, Mr. Bustamante, did you hear the last question we asked the candidates? No, I, I've been having some technical problems here. Okay. Um, what I'll go ahead and do is repeat this question um, since only one person has answered it so far, and I will add you to the bottom of the rotation. Um, okay. So to repeat the question, it I said, uh, studies are showing that District 1 residents, homeowners and renters are being displaced because of speculation and investment in rate developments that are leading to exponential jumps in property tax appraisals and home prices. How will you help prevent displacement of homeowners and renters in our neighborhoods? Um, the next candidate to answer this question will be Mario Bravo. Thank you. You know, our, our council member just mentioned that he's the chair of our property, property tax assessment district board. And that's a huge source of our housing affordability crisis. Um, you know, and we haven't seen any progress over there. Actually, it's gotten much worse. Um, I support uh, a change in our charter language to be able to allow our citizens to vote on future bonds that will allow us to fund uh, affordable housing projects. Uh, I, I support the new uh, UDC updates for building codes. Um, I support building in major corridors in downtown, um, but at the same time, I wanna make sure that we preserve the character of our neighborhoods and you know best how to do that. Uh, we have a re representative form of government. I wanna take your input to inform the policies that I, that I support at uh, City Hall. I think we can do a better job of listening to you. Um, you know, filing CCRs is, has been unfortunately <clears throat> fairly ineffective, um, especially if you can't get to six votes. And um, I wanna be a collaborator listening to you, working with our colleagues at City Hall to see how we can improve this situation for everybody. And uh, you know, you're an important partner and I really look forward to working with you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Gauna. Yes, uh, I guess the main thing here is being uh, our current residents, uh, lifelong residents being displaced due to, you know, incoming developers. Uh, We've seen an increase of demolitions uh, under uh, our current city council, uh, you know, taking people out of homes that are, you know, perfectly fine and uh, putting them, you know, very, very well onto the street uh, if they don't have uh, other residences to call home. So, uh, you know, with uh, our, uh, you know, if elected as councilman, you know, we would try to, we, we will put a stop to demolitions, uh, you know, put displacing people out of their homes is uh, not what the city council or, or you know, a city department should be doing uh, uh, with the uh, higher taxes. Uh, with, with higher taxes, we're not seeing any uh, increase in public uh, infrastructure investment. Uh, you know, if, if we are to pay these higher taxes, we should be getting something in return. And we're frankly not seeing that. Uh, we've uh, seen the uh, committee uh, approve, uh, you know, uh, these demolitions, uh, you know, on the uh, west side and, uh, you know, in our more near our downtown area. So we would work with developers to go uh, develop in areas that are 
uh, empty, such as parking lots, uh, which there are a lot of uh, downtown, you know, empty space that it is ripe for development, uh, you know, instead of going after, uh, you know, people in their homes. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bustamante. Yes, uh, am I unmuted? Yes. Okay. Yes, as to the uh, the uh, uh, displacement, we, we have laws that protect property owners, that protect renters, uh, and that protect homeowners. Uh, so my proposal would be to uh, establish a public defender's office that would represent these people because these these involve legal issues and legal laws that that, uh, that protect uh, the individual. So my proposal is to is to formulate a, a public defender's office that would that would represent these people and explain to them uh, the situation and their rights. And uh, as far as the property tax, uh, the what seems to be happening with the property tax is, is an increase without representation. I think increased you know, property taxes are, you know, a bit unconstitutional since basically what they're doing is they're imposing an income tax where where the state doesn't have an income tax. They're imposing an income tax by using the the uh, uh, property tax. So I think there's a basic flaw in that system, and, and uh, I would probably urge the attorney general to pursue the constitutionality. Of that. So. Again, there's 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 basic laws and that protect the basic rights of everyone, but what's lacking is legal representation. So again, my proposal would be a a, a, a public defender's office or a, a an appointment system where where people can be appointed an attorney to to wade through the legal process. Thank you. Thank you. This next question is going to go first to Mr. Bravo. In the struggle, in, I'm sorry, in the struggle for housing affordability, it is often the most affordable housing is the housing we already have. Yet many investors are eager to demolish our housing stock to make room for higher density developments. Historic and landmark designation is one of the few tools that neighborhood residents have to push back against these profit-driven demolitions in legacy neighborhoods. The state legislature has been making it more and more difficult to designate historic properties without the owner's consent. What is your opinion on the rights of private property owners versus the rights of neighborhood residents when it comes to historic and landmark designation and the protection of our leg legacy housing stock? Sorry. Um, well, we need to make sure that anybody who's purchasing a property knows well, what they're purchasing and knows the rules around that, you know, and recognizes that the community has already agreed on how you can develop in that neighborhood and what you can tear down, what you can't. Um, you know, not all neighborhoods are created equal. I want to make decisions with you at the table um, and ta tailor the approach to your needs. I think that. Um, you know, we need to protect the rules that we have. And part of that is gonna be uh, when we, um, every, every two years when the state legislature meets, uh, we look at, you know, what are our legislative priorities? We take your tax dollars and we hire lobbyists and we send them to, to the state legislature and uh, we have them protect the, the laws that are important to us and uh, we have them uh, support legislation that would be beneficial to us that our community supports and we need we need to do a better job of listening to you when we develop our legislative agenda uh, right now it seems like um, there are just a select few who get to sit, sit to get, get together and develop that legislative agenda and take it to city hall and I think we need a better public participation process in doing that and making sure that we have that we are supporting state laws that protect the things that we cherish most um, at your neighborhood level. Thank you. Mr. Yana. 
Yes. Uh, you know, like I said, uh, we've seen an increase in demolitions, uh, you know, uh, by the the city, you know, uh, you know, not necessarily developers, but we do see developers come in and buy these empty lots and then get a group of empty lots, you know, slap some townhouses, uh, you know, in the middle of a neighborhood. And aesthetically, that's just not pleasing, uh, you know, so we should be working you know, with the city towards, you know, a, a design that we, you know, flows from one community to the next so that there's not, you know, an abrupt change in, you know, design or aesthetic. Uh, again, uh, with uh, with developers, uh, you, you, you might uh, hear from them, they have no choice but to build residential, uh, you know, uh, in these residential areas because of, you know, zoning laws. So we would, if elected councilman, we would work to uh, change the zoning laws uh, in our city so we can have uh, mixed use uh, development, uh, you know, underground parking uh, as a priority, you know, to in increase the walkability of areas and, you know, the affordability and accessibility, uh, you know, as of now, you know, our current, uh, you know, plan for the city, you know, doesn't address uh, those uh, uh, in the community with disabilities, those who are elderly, those uh, who, you know, have young children. So, uh, you know, you know, these are the things that need to be addressed when, you know, uh, talking to developers about their property rights versus, you know, uh, you know, people, uh, neighborhoods, property, uh, people in the neighborhoods, property rights. Uh, you know, because again, this is working to build a, a community and, uh, you know, so we, we, we would uh, like to keep, uh, you know, affordable housing and, and such. Thank you. Thank you. Next, let's hear from Mr. Bustamante. Yes, uh, there's basic human rights. Uh, you know, people have a right to, uh, to be safe in their neighborhoods, they have a right to be healthy in their neighbors, neighborhoods, and they have a right to be happy and, and leave, live serenely in their neighborhood. So the, these basic rights are, should be protected by the city. And the city does this by, by codes. They, they do it by uh, a zoning, uh, participation in the zoning or rezoning. Again, the, the, we, we have, we have some basic rights. Right? We have the laws that protect people, you know, shelter and to protect their their uh, uh, their their happiness in their home and, and their health in their home. So that's that and health especially because some of these some of these buildings are, you know, just they they look like you know fire hazards and like matchboxes. So I think you know we need to have ordinances to have buildings. Uh, become fireproof. Another problem is energy, and these buildings should become solar solar energy efficient. That's right. They should make they should they should be an improvement to the community, a healthy improvement to the community, and 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 protect you know people's you know peaceful living in these communities. So again, we have the laws that that protect these people and and. Uh, uh, we need to enforce the laws. One of the things that, that comes up a lot is eminent domain, uh, the right of, you know, municipalities to, to make way uh, for projects under under the, the cloaked eminent domain. So, again, these are legal issues, and, and again, there's, there's laws to protect the property owners and, and uh, protect the, uh, the homeowners. So, uh, again, the city has a, a massive legal department, and that massive legal department should be expanded to to a, a public defense system to represent both sides. You know, represent the, the, the builders and represent the homeowners uh, in a in a in a system like like mediation or. Yes, thank you. 
Hello. It looks like uh, Anissa may have some additional technical difficulties here. Cynthia, do you have the next question? I do, thank you. May I answer that question too? Uh, apologies, Councilman, <laughs> with the loss of the moderator, I lost where we were. Uh, so the same question posed to you, Councilman Trevino. Thank you, Jordan. Um, <clears throat> well, you know, we all remember Miguel Calzada and, and the process of that. Uh, we are currently working on a demolition moratorium. We filed also a CCR adopted in 2017 to increase the burden of proof needed to demolish a home. From 2019 to 2021, there were about 20 demolitions per year. This is a dram dramatic decrease from prior years, but we know that we can have even fewer demolitions with programs like Under One Roof that has done over a thousand roofs to date. In many cases, historic designation benefits a community, encourages better design, Histori historically designated properties appreciate, increases neighborhood pride and awareness. It can revitalize a neighborhood, protect owners and residents from incompatible development, helps curb urban sprawl, reusing of existing resources. Another policy that I propose called deconstruction by promoting infill development as well. A historic district that is aesthetically cohesive and well promoted can be a community attraction and generate econ economic activity. At the same time, there are folks who often have reservations with becoming a historic neighborhood. Usually folks are concerned that every, everything from the color of their house uh, to the interior will need approval, or they are concerned that they will need to make uh, costly restorations or hire design professionals in order to uh, be in compliance. These concerns are often go away when the policy is explained. That's why it's important that all residents are aware and are involved in any historic designation decision. We also have NCDs that we've worked hard to make sure that you know, people are aware of, work uh, alongside many uh, uh, districts or uh, neighborhoods to, to help them uh, complete uh, NCDs where, wherever they would like. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Our next question has to do with incompatible infill. As housing pressure increases in San Antonio, there are few District 1 neighborhoods that do not have examples of incompatible infill development, whether it be tall condos next to modest bungalows or towering garage apartments. It seems that the UDC has been left open, has, has been left to open generous interpretation and that generally prefers the highest profit over the letter or intent of the code. What will you do to address issues of incompatible infill development and ensure the preservation of our legacy neighborhoods? Uh, Mario Bravo, would you like to go first, please? Thanks. Uh, we've all seen where somebody comes in and they take a piece of property and uh, they subdivide it and you know build where there was in an area where there was single family homes, they, they built six units and then the land value increases 12 fold. Um, and you know, we have to be very careful how we're affecting our neighborhoods, um, you know, and uh, I will not move forward with zoning decisions without your input every step of the way. I want to make sure that you're at the table. You know what works in your neighborhood best. Um, one of the challenges we have is, you know, that the Bayer appraisal district is taxing property at the highest and best use rather than at its current use. And so that's a challenge as well. Um, and so I think that's something that we need to address. Um, we need to be careful for house flippers um, who are harassing people who are calling code compliance on elderly who aren't able to upkeep their homes. Um, and uh, I think we need to, to work on upzoning on regional centers and, and transportation corridors. So um, I, I look forward to working with you on how we can best do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry for my uh, camera keep dropping out. Um, Mr. Gauna, please um, take the question. Uh, uh, for uh, you know, incompatible uh, infill development, uh, we we see a, a lot of that. Uh, you know, uh, towards the downtown area, like uh, right now, I'm looking at Brackenridge Ave and North Pine Street. Uh, some uh, you know, town uh, townhouses crammed into, uh, you know, in between, uh, you know, the, the Beverly and the Cortland, uh, you know, the, the, 
this is not compatible, uh, you know, infrastructure or, or development. Uh, you know, these these neighborhoods are not walkable. They're, uh, you know, not located near uh, any necessities like a, a grocery store or, you know, a convenience store. So, you know, you know, people can easily access, you know, you know, places like this. So, you know, it, did these sort of developments, uh, we hear from residents that we don't want to see those in the future, uh, you know. But at the same time, we need more housing to uh, address, uh, you know, the, the influx of people coming in. You know, and we can't continue building out, you know, increasing our urban sprawl. Uh, we have to, you know, start centralizing in the downtown area. And that would be through, you know, more compatible uh, tower designs located in the downtown area rather than, you know, townhomes uh, crammed next to apartments, crammed next to, uh, you know, a house. Uh, so we we would work with neighborhoods like the, the, the tier one uh, neighborhood coalition uh, to find, uh, you know, solutions for affordable housing and accessible uh, neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bustamante. Hello, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, sir. Okay, well, basically, as I, as I listen to all these solutions, I, I just think of the basics, and that is the, the uh, legal issues involved. And again, we're talking about individuals that have issues with the community development. So I, I go back to my proposal of having a public defendant uh, that's familiar with this, with the property laws and the, and the situated contracts and ordinances to advise the individuals as to what their avenues are. You know, for example, in the property tax uh, situation, an individual can, can ask for uh, uh, an appeal. He can ask for mediation. Uh, after everything fails, they can appeal up to to district court and have their case go to court, which many corporations do. Uh, so again, it involves legal issues, and I think it, there's there's a tremendous need for a for a city public defender's office to to help the individuals uh, wade through these these difficult uh, laws. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Anissa. And again, this is another great example of working with neighborhoods and, uh, and of course, my great staff. Uh, if you recall the, the issues we had with the SA Tomorrow Plan and incorporating neighborhood plans to be uh, listed and, and, and to have that verbiage in SA Tomorrow and the comprehensive planning, because that's so critical. That really spells out a lot of what you want. Uh, so we were very, very much uh, a part of that. We joined you in that, supported you, and uh, made sure that that language got put in, in, in that. Uh, additionally, I wanna say, uh, we always have uh, strong, strong folks representing District 1 for zoning, from our zoning commissioners to, to my zoning representative on, uh, in, my, in my field office. Uh, additionally, I wanna say, uh, we just completed this week, we voted on the large area rezoning for Monte Vista. I want to thank uh, all the residents uh, that helped make that happen. Uh, we're very, very proud of that. And this is that started with a CCR. Uh, again, a success story that is going to be expanding throughout the district. And I can tell you, uh, my council colleagues are all looking at that because that is an important aspect of what we're talking about. A lot of this development goes to uh, the incompatibility of what's designated of the land. It's not necessarily what is what is there now. You might have a single family residence that is designated with an MF33, which then puts pressure on that property because there are speculators that will come in and they look for that, that uh, uh, zoning designation to do those kinds of things, to, to, uh, to build it out at, at its maximum capacity. We know that's incompatible and we're working to fix that. And it's really one of the proudest things we've done together with neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, this is the last of our um, pre-prepared questions, and it's going to go first, Mr. Gauna. Tier one was formed as citizens 
struggled with the city to include neighborhood voices and perspectives in the SA 2020 comprehensive plan. These and other development and policy issues directly affect us. In 2019, City Council approved the public participation principles as a policy, but this is often disregarded or forgotten and is not an ordinance. If elected, what would you do to ensure that community is represented on issues surrounding development, transportation, housing, environment, and other important policy issues? Uh, I'd like to first thank you all uh, for, you know, as you said, this, this coalition was formed uh, out of the need to, uh, you know, hear our neighborhood's voice. So, you know, uh, I thank, thank y'all for taking that initiative and we need to reward uh, other people in the community who also take uh, initiative and, uh, you know, planning their uh, communities. Uh, you know, with the SA 2020 plan, we saw a disregard for, uh, you know, individual community, uh, you know, you, you, you named the marginalized group, uh, th those people were ignored, uh, you know, over, you know, uh, our municipal utilities uh, voice like CPS, you know, uh, business, uh, you know, vo their voice was, you know, listened to the most, uh, you know, in, in situations. So, you know, we often see community, uh, you know, input disregarded, uh, you know, when planning uh, such issues. Uh, so we would, uh, look to working with communities on environmental issues, on transportation issues, uh, you know, and, and affordable housing issues that have been, you know, ignored uh, by, you know, city council and our city department. So uh, again, uh, thank you for, you know, taking that, uh, you know, initiative, you know, to raise, you know, your voices, uh, in the community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Monte. Hello. Yes, we can hear you, sir. Yes, uh, that, that's a very broad question and it involves many, many, many issues, uh, but I think it, it all boils down to, uh, you know, people's health, uh, safety and and uh, and happiness. So, my proposal is to to strengthen the the legal system at the at the city hall and and expand it to uh, provide representation for the individuals that have problems. You know, the the state and the and the federal government have many organizations. You know, such as the Rio Grande uh, Legal Aid. They have the Consumer Protection Agency, uh, and and they have uh, organizations that help the individuals, and they're and they're they're funded by the by the uh, by the state or the uh, or the federal government. And the city should have a, a similar system that's funded by the city by the taxpayers to represent the individuals in the individual cases. Uh, we need a system like that in the in the municipal court system, public defender in the municipal court system. And also in, in in all these issues that that uh, that were brought up in this broad question. So, with uh, with my legal experience, I intend to have a uh, an administration that offers free legal help and representation to to those in need in my community. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Trevino. Thank you, Anissa. Uh, you know, and it, it was just like I was just saying, uh, this is something that we brought up. Uh, this is where District 1 really prides itself in making sure that we are the voice uh, for you. We help uh, to provide uh, that connectivity. Uh, we helped uh, Tier 1 uh, uh, 
put the brakes on the neighborhood registry. We have done so many things to, to uh, represent you. Again, uh, our actions have, have spoken louder than words. Uh, and uh, we ask that you, that you simply look at our record on, on how we've done that. <clears throat> we believe that, that uh, neighborhoods should have a voice and we're not afraid to hold city staff accountable. Uh, from our planning department to neighborhood and housing services, we have seen uh, examples because we've been there uh, right beside you uh, of how sometimes there might be things that uh, are not included or uh, got misplaced or, or uh, just weren't agreed on. And we want to make sure that, that those the kinds of things that we help to uh, be a, a, an incredible voice for, for you. Uh, we talked about the UDC amendments and how we needed to put a pause on that because of this pandemic. Uh, this, this is exactly what we do in District 1 and we're not afraid to hold people accountable. Uh, this is uh, you know, the, the work that we do every single day. And you know, my staff uh, represents you in, in the same way I just described. Thank you. Is Anissa frozen? Should I go? I think she'll be right back. I'm back on. Oh, good. I'm sorry. Um, I believe it's Mr. Bravo's turn. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for bringing up the principles of public participation, because I, I actually helped behind the scenes. I assisted in the development of that. And I believe that we need more of that. Absolutely, our city is failing in this regard. Um, if you look at, um, you know, when I've talked to people who sat on the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee, everybody I've talked to, it doesn't matter if they represent American Indians in Texas, it doesn't matter if they represent the downtown business district, they told me the city did not listen to us. They did not, you know, they ignored us. They didn't even meet with them except for once in the last year. And so they were learning about what how the city was moving forward on the Alamo master plan by reading the newspaper. And that's not how it, this works. Uh, you know, my personal experience working on a, a working group for the development of the climate plan, they did, the city did not listen to us. They went and they made their own decisions behind closed doors. Uh, we, all, we all have experienced this in different ways, different forms. I used to serve, I mean, my record serves, um, speaks for itself. I served as a chair of a stakeholder group, meeting with senior staff at CPS Energy. And they refuse to be accountable. They refuse to be transparent. Um, you know, I pushed for they, their board meetings were held at one o'clock on a Monday, and they weren't video streamed, so there's no way you could watch them. I got them. I led efforts to get them to change that. They didn't allow public comment at their board meetings. I led efforts to get them to change that. Uh, their citizens advisory committee was meeting in secret. They didn't publish meeting minutes. They didn't publish meeting agendas. I led efforts to get them to change that. Still, CPS Energy is not accountable to us. And we need to, to work on that more. We finally got this rate advisory committee and I will continue to be a champion on these efforts because I completely disagree with Councilman Trevino. I couldn't disagree more. We have failed on this. The city has failed us on this issue and the citizens deserve a voice um, in their own government. And we, you know, we need to make, we need, we need to do so much more on meaningful public engagement. Thank you. Um, at this time, we're, I'm going to hand this over to Jordan Gawi uh, from the Beacon Hill Neighborhood Association um, to uh, speak to some of the community questions that he's collected. Um, the first question should start with Councilman Trevino. All right, this one was sent to me in a direct message from one of our audience members. It pertains to property taxes. If a proposal to freeze property taxes for one year was presented to city council, how would you vote? Well, you know, uh, it's an important part to, uh, to uh, point out that city council uh, only votes on the city portion of your taxes. So as, as was mentioned earlier, I said in the appraisal district, that uh, is the appraisal process that, that designates 100% of your value, which then goes to the taxing entities. 21% of your taxing, uh, of your taxes uh, are, are the city taxes. So if we were to freeze because of this pandemic, uh, I would be in support of that. Last year, we, we wrote a, a letter to the governor asking that they roll property tax values. That's across the board. That would have been that 
that essentially the values would have been frozen for a year across the board because we knew there was a lot of uh, anxiety about property taxes uh, it, because of the pandemic. And so uh, we're working very hard to uh, educate folks about their property tax rights and hope to have uh, you know, many more uh, forums around property taxes with Chief Amesquita. But the question you're asking, just want everybody to know that that's only 21% of your overall tax bill. And that is really, really uh, important. But yes, I would vote to, to, to freeze that because uh, of the anxiety over, over property tax values uh, over the pandemic. Thank you, Councilman Anissa. Who was after uh, the Councilman? Mr. Bravo. Can you repeat the question, please? Sure. The question was, if a proposal to freeze property taxes for one year was presented to City Council, how would you vote? So I think that's just one tool that we could possibly have. And we need to look at all the tools that we can have to, because the whole deal is we need property tax relief. Right? And we heard Councilman Trevino explain how they work, but we haven't explained how he's made them better as chair of BCAD. And so I would really support a study looking comprehensively at why is our property tax burden so high? You know, and I think we should look at everything. We should look at, you know, where are we, uh, where are we not spending responsibly? You know, I, I, I was quite frankly shocked that council voted and, and Councilman Trevino voted to spend $39 million to remodel their own council offices. And so, you know, I'd rather that money go towards services that, you know, you, you, where you see a difference in your neighborhood, like sidewalks in your neighborhood. Um, and, you know, we look at, uh, the Frost, Tank, Frost Bank Tower that the city bought and we're remodeling it. And I think uh, cost overruns are $47 million now. And the city won't even accept responsibility for that. They're saying, well, this is, this, it's, uh, we're, ta we're, we're revenue neutral on this. So it, it's, it's not an issue. Well, that $47 million could have been spent in another way or could have not been spent. And so there's so many ways in which we, that we could possibly uh, reduce the tax burden on the community. There's so many ways in which we could spend tax dollars in ways that make a difference in your life at your neighborhood level. And so I would want to look at this. I wouldn't want to limit ourselves to one tool. I would want to look at the situation comprehensively and say, what, what is the best approach? What are all of the things that we can do? Where, what, are all, what are all of our tools that we can leverage right now? Thank you. Next is Mr. Gauna. Thank you. Uh, short answer, yes. Uh, long answer, uh, we should have done this uh, since the beginning. Uh, this, uh, you know, property tax freeze would have helped a lot of people uh, had it happened sooner. Um, you know, and, you know, perhaps going forward, we identify individuals, uh, you know, who are having uh, abnormally high property tax increases and, you know, analyze why that is happening and, you know, uh, get, get those individuals, uh, you know, the uh, t uh, tax freeze that they uh, would need to, you know, uh, in increase their uh, economic uh, outcome and quality of life. Uh, so again, why, why uh, haven't any of these solutions taken place, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, not just from the the current uh, council member, but other members of council and the mayor as well. Uh, you know, we should all be questioning why, uh, you know, these things are, are taking longer than in other major cities, you know, so something to, you know, compare to, I guess. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bustamante. Yes, the, uh, the property tax situation is, is should be on an individual basis. Each case should be looked at individually, see what effect it's, it's had. Uh, just increasing property taxes to 
on everyone is just a violation of due process, and it's a violation of the constitutional rights and a violation of the property rights. But because they don't have the representation, they end up losing their homes for foreclosure, property tax foreclosures, you know, especially on the South side, many people have lost their homes because they, they just can't afford to pay the taxes. Businesses go under because they can't afford to pay the taxes. This is, this is a, a, a taxation without representation, a violation of due process. Again, we have, we have the system to, to take care of these problems on an individual basis, but we don't have, the people don't have the tools or the access to the tools. You know, we have uh, the, the Consumer Protection Agency that, that uh, helps consumers. We've got uh, Rio Grande Legal Aid that helps uh, in many situations, but we, we don't have a tax court. We don't have uh, pro bono uh, tax help. We don't have uh, uh, pro bono representation. We don't have, uh, uh, you know, free representation for these needy people. And I think, I think each case really should be looked at on an individual basis and nobody should be forced to, to out of their home because it's been sold for taxes. So I, that, 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 that's a big problem and it's going to become a bigger problem. The taxes not only should be frozen, they should be reduced across the board. I think there's, there's, there's a lot of waste that's been mentioned and, uh, and there's many solutions that we can that we can provide to the community to to lessen their economic burden. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jordan has the next question, and the first person to answer will be Mr. Bustamante. All right. We had polled our neighborhoods that are members of the Tier One NC and asked them to submit questions as well. And here is one submitted by one of the residents. In 2017 and 2018, the top 30% of SAW's residential users underpaid by about $2.3 million per month, a subsidy paid for by the other 70% of users. The lowest 10% of water using residential households made the largest contribution to that subsidy. If elected, what solutions will, you, will your office provide to ensure a more equitable system of billing based on actual water usage? Well, I guess the, the, the again, it, it, it's going to go, it, it comes down to an individual basis and, and, and the individual should, should be able to go to C CPS and work out a situation, work out a problem, uh, have their meter checked. I know there's a lot of errors are committed in the meter readings. Uh, also, you know, a broken infrastructure and, and, uh, and high rising costs. Again, the right to water is a, is a basic right, and it should be protected. and uh, and And people shouldn't shouldn't be allowed to to suffer the economic economic harms uh, that are involved. So, you know, again, uh, infrastructure, the water infrastructure is is a is a major problem, and I think uh, we need to the city needs to work on that to, to you know have a healthy safe environment uh, with water we, we have we have the water system we just we don't we just don't have the infrastructure to take care of it really um, maybe better metering uh, would be a solution but again uh, it's it's on an individual basis and probably we should expand the, the water boards uh, uh, intake procedure where they where people come in and take a number and then they're they're seen on a on a on a you know sit down and wait basis and, and that could that could be better done maybe over the internet to solve these problems also if a water bill is is appears too high it should be a you know an automatic red red flag and and uh saw should should go out individually and check on you know check on any leaks and things like that so Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Trevino. Thank you, Anissa. Well, I would start first by empowering the SAWS Rate Advisory Committee by increasing uh, representation 
or most vulnerable rate payers like seniors and low-income families. Additionally, uh, we know that we put additional pressure uh, uh, on SAW uh, with, with this latest uh, 1 cent sales tax vote that I, I just sim simply did not support because, again, there, there really isn't much of an answer for how we're, we're going to uh, be able to absorb that much uh, cost into SAWs without a rate increase. Uh, I think we're going to see that. Uh, I caution us. I cautioned us from from uh, from doing that because we had already gone from a 2.7 uh, percent uh, uh, take from from saws to a 4 percent, and uh, adding that on top of it, I think it just puts pressure on on a potential rate increase. Uh, but again, uh, what we would need to do is we need to make sure that we empower our most vulnerable, including our seniors. Thank you, Mr. Bravo. So the first thing that we have to understand is that, um, well, okay, first of all, the for the person who wrote this question, they're absolutely right. Our, our, our water rates are inequitable and that needs to be addressed. Now we have just procured the most expensive water source in the nation with Vista Ridge, right? And with, with that have come multiple opportunities or multiple um, rate increases with SAWS and at each, every time we voted for a rate increase, there was an opportunity to adjust the rate structure and Councilman Trinity has, has had multiple opportunities to, to, ad to address this rate structure and to the rate advisory committees has never taken those opportunities. I sat in and saw his rate advisory committee meetings, which the, the, the outcome was already predetermined. And so people would want to look at equity issues um, on the rates and saw staff would say, well, you know, you don't get to look at that. You know, there's just here's this 10 percent of the rate structure that you get to look at. And that's it. And so what was the point? People were frustrated that they were on a rate advisory committee in which they couldn't provide input on the issues that were most important to them. And so we have failed miserably on that. I will be a champion. Not just myself, because I have to recognize that I'm only one vote when I'm on council. I have to go and work with my colleagues and build consensus and bring them along and get to six votes so that we can effectively um, implement um, what your voice and, and uh, push through your priorities at City Hall and through our utilities so that we can be empowered here in our government. Great, thank you. Um, Mr. Gauna. Yes. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, before you get started, um, I just want to remind Mr. Bustamante, could you please mute your microphone um, when you're not speaking? It, it keeps cutting into the other candidates. Thank you. Please go ahead, Mr. Gauna. Thank you. Uh, you know, I believe the question is about, uh, you know, pricing, um, uh, you know, equitable pricing on water. Uh, so, you know, you know, our biggest water users uh, in the summer uh, are places such as like UTSA, USAA, uh, you know, big uh, mansion style homes and the such. Uh, you know, I encourage everybody here to, you know, uh, go online and uh, research who is using the most water in San Antonio because, uh, you know, once, once you see that, you know, these people are using, you know, hundreds of times more water than, you know, the average citizen are paying, you know, you know, below average rates, if not subsidized rates. So, uh, you know, it, it should be concerning to everybody here who, you know, pays. Uh, you know, a, a bill to SAWS, you know, why are we having to not water our lawns in the summer? Uh, you know, uh, why are we having to do these things during a drought restriction, uh, you know, when the highest water users are not, are not, you know, average citizens, you know, their corporations or university or, you know, wealthy individuals. So, uh, you know, we, if elected, we would bring, you know, a, try to rein in the, the saws, uh, you know, unfair pricing, you know, uh, Mr. Bravo brought up the Vista Ridge pipeline, you know, that, 
uh, you know, is not equitable when we have uh, when we were pumping our clean Edwards aquifer water out to areas to be sold, uh, we're seeing none of the profits from saws, but yet we're getting this subpar quality drinking water from Vista Ridge pumped into our homes, uh, you know, from near Dallas. So, you know, uh, it's just something to think about. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have time for one last question. And uh, Mr. Ghana, you will be the first to answer it. Jordan, go ahead. Mr. Ghana, what does the future of transportation look like in San Antonio? You know, uh, if elected, I believe that the future of San Antonio uh, transportation, uh, you know, includes a subway system, heavy rail or medium rail, uh, you know, transportation uh, that could be done through uh, a sky train or like I. To, uh, you know, a subway. Uh, we we cannot continue this, uh, you know, love affair with highways. Uh, you know, sooner or later, you know, space is going to run out. So we need to look to, you know, tunneling uh, technologies have drastically improved in the past decade. So we can look to, uh, you know, working with VIA, you know, on this, uh, you know, uh, city council served up a a uh, subpar uh, streetcar system, uh, you know, we, a streetcar system is fine for smaller cities, but, uh, you know, a, a large city like San Antonio with a population of, you know, 2 million and growing, uh, we, we need to, you know, help people move quicker. Uh, and that would, uh, that would mean placing where their work uh, near where they live. So we would try to cut down on transportation times by in introducing affordable housing and, you know, uh, you know, uh, a light rail, uh, sorry, excuse me, a heavy rail uh, high speed transit system. Uh, you know, when you are stuck in traffic, you know, on, a, you know, 5 p.m. on 410 and I-10 or, uh, you know, I-10 near downtown and I-1035 over change, you know, just something to think about, you know, why, why don't we have high speed rail? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bustamante. Uh, sir, you are muted now. Hello. Yeah. Yes, I think the future of transportation lies in electric vehicles and um, and autonomous vehicles. I think electric vehicles are uh, are good for the environment. They're uh, good for the health of the community. Uh, they're energy energy savers and and uh, autonomous vehicles uh, are becoming very sophisticated now and. Uh, uh, they they can uh, they can address a lot of our transportation problems. Many cities are already using electric buses. Uh, there's also many cities experimenting with autonomous vehicles. Uh, I think that's that's the future. We're also seeing a lot of cities using or starting to use um, air taxis, uh, uh, high speed you know high speed rail uh, tunneling. Uh, those are those are uh, the solutions. Those are the transportation solutions for the future. Tesla's building a, a, a mega factory in Austin. Uh, in, in order to increase the use of electric vehicles, we need to provide incentives, uh, tax write-offs or tax breaks, uh, incentives for individuals to to uh, purchase uh, electric vehicles. Uh, so I think I think that's that's the future of our transportation. I think the solutions are there, and and they're very cost effective. Uh, we don't have to rely on the antiquated uh, gas engines and and systems that we have. We can we can provide low low cost uh, electric vehicles. China has a vehicle for four thousand five hundred dollars electric car.
All right, thank you. Um, Councilman Trevino. Thank you, Anissa. Uh, well, the, the future is multimodal. It looks, it's, it's about having quality walkable sidewalks, uh, safe access to bus shelters, but most importantly, and it's something that I brought up yesterday, uh, the upcoming bond that uh, we're all going to be talking about towards the end of this year uh, is it, it's and how important it is for tier one neighborhoods to be involved to talk about how to better connect their citizens to all the resources that and amenities that are out there. Uh, this is part of how we can make a better, better uh, place for all of us truly, truly impact the quality of life for all our neighborhoods, uh, connect our regional centers. And most importantly, we also created uh, or brought back a transportation department. Uh, we have a transportation director and having those conversations is gonna be so critical. We talked about making sure that we uh, create uh, multimodal uh, spots one including our, our international airport, connecting the three different airports that we do have, Port SA, International, and Stinson Airport. Uh, there's so many opportunities that, that uh, San Antonio has ahead of it, and it starts with this bond and including tier one neighborhoods. Thank you. Mr. Bravo. Thank you. Uh, I agree with Councilman Trevino that it, it's gonna be multimodal. Um, but I also think it's going to include complete streets. And, and to me, complete streets means that you have uh, safe bike lanes. And safe, safe bike lanes, it does not mean you just paint a white line on the road. Um, but, uh, you know, this also reminds me, this conversation reminds me of Connect SA. And I think that's another example of where we didn't get public participation right. So I don't know if anybody else here tried to get involved with Connect SA, but trying to get on their advisory committee, that was like a black hole. And so at the end of the day, you know, what is the, what does my transportation plan look like for the future of San Antonio? It's not about my transportation plan. It's about the community's plan. It's about bringing everybody together because we are not going to have true effective public transportation without buying from the community, without getting everybody on board and, you know, with, without just getting um, support from across the community. Uh, you know, I think that uh, we can have advanced rapid transit. Uh, I think we can look at uh, increasing frequency on existing routes. Um, a lot of this has to do with uh, transportation justice um, and just making sure that, it, that everybody has access to be able to get to better jobs, to get to an educate uh, wherever they want to get an education, where to be able to get to um, places where they can buy healthy food. And uh, at the end of the day, I don't have all the best answers, the community does. And so that's how we're going to move forward. And Anissa, I captured a total of six other questions in here, sorry, maybe seven, that we will be posing to the candidates via email. These are the questions that we didn't have time to ask you all today. So we'll send them to your respective email addresses, capture your answers, and we'll make sure that we post that on our tier one uh, websites so that you guys can get those answers that you deserve. Thank you. Um, before we, or just as we wrap up, um, I would like to have uh, each of the candidates um, take one minute each to um, give any closing remarks that they would like to give. Um, and then we will turn it over to Cynthia Spielman. So um, uh, go ahead in the same order. Uh, Mr. Bravo, you may go first. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this opportunity um, to introduce myself to some of you all and to listen um, uh, to the questions that you have that are most important to you. I have a track record of building coalitions. I have a track record of working with communities, um, of working on public policy. And, uh, you know, I have a track record of challenging property taxes as a hobby to learn more firsthand at how unfair and inconsistent the property tax system that we have is. And I want to work with you to resolve that. I won't count my successes by the number of CCRs I've filed. I won't count my successes by the number of pilot projects I've launched. I'm gonna count my successes by the progress that, that you are able to see at your neighborhood level. I'm gonna count my successes by the services delivered to you. And I'm gonna count my successes um, when we can see that we're no longer taxing people out of their homes. So I look forward to working with neighborhoods. I look forward to working with my fellow city council members to do what's needed to get to six votes so that I can implement your agenda. 
Uh, I invite you to get more involved, to learn more about me, visit mariobravo.org. That's M-A-R-I-O-B-R-A-V-O.org and where you can sign up to volunteer, where you can make a contribution, where you can learn more about me, where you can find my email and write me directly. I would love to hear from you and meet with you and your community, hear, your, hear more of your ideas one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Bustamante, one minute, please. Mr. Bustamante, you're still on mute. If you wanted to unmute yourself, um, we'd like to hear your closing remarks. Hello? We can hear you. Okay. All right. I'm, I have um, a doctorate in jurisprudence. I've been practicing law for some 35 years. Uh, I've represented many, many individuals here in San Antonio. And what's basic to everybody is due process and constitutional law their health, safety, and happiness. The problems that people present usually end up in some type of legal uh, quagmire. So my proposal is to bring city council up to the level of the state level and the federal level that provides uh, free legal aid on an individual basis, public defenders on an individual basis, consumer protection, pro bono representation, and also provide incentives for the community to increase their their health and safety and, and happiness. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gauna. Thank you all for having me again. Uh, you know, uh, San Antonio needs to look to the future and that uh, candidate is me, Matthew J. Gauna for District 1, uh, a student of environmental science and biology. We have uh, an architect, uh, a hist uh, historian, and a lawyer. Uh, you know, none of those truly represent the people of San Antonio. Uh, you know, born and raised in San Antonio for the past 23 years, went to UTSA. And I know the problems that San Antonio faces. And I know what it takes to take this city to a tier one city, like the likes of New York, Tokyo, Vancouver, and such. Uh, I ask that the community reach out uh, to our website at almostcreekpark.com, uh, almostcreekpark.com. Uh, you know, it's our uh, volunteer service and you can reach us through there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Trevino. Thank you, Anissa. And I would just say uh, thank you to all of you. I see a lot of recognizable faces uh, in this forum and it is because we've worked together. We've done a lot of great things, uh, Anissa. Uh, you and I have, have worked together and you represent us uh, in, in, in the committee. Uh, we have, uh, I can see Cynthia, I can see uh, Jordan Gowie, uh, lots of great folks from different neighborhoods that, that really have helped us to work together uh, to implement policy, policy that's enforceable and long-term, uh, like the large area rezoning that we just adopted that's so, so important. Pilot programs like the Right to Counsel have prevented nine out of 10 families from evictions. Uh, we have saved uh, over a thousand homes. Those are families living in those homes. Our focus is on people and I'm driven by that conviction. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, at this time, I'm going to, going to turn it over to Cynthia Spielman of Beacon Hill. We want to thank the candidates for coming tonight. We want to thank the audience who's joined us. We'd also like to thank the planning team who helped put this on from representatives from the following associations, Beacon Hill, Tobin Hill Community, Almost Park Terrace, Keystone Neighborhood, West End Hope and Action, Monte Vista Terrace, King William, La Vaca Neighborhood Association in Monte Vista. This is the kind of cooperation that tier one is all about. If your neighborhood would like to be included on our mailing list, please contact t1nc.sat at gmail.com. And just a reminder, you'll see it in the chat of our virtual um, workshop on Saturday, March 27th at 10. 
Um, thank you all. And I'd like to have the last word to go to Mrs. Betty Eckert from Almost Park Terrace. How about that? I get the last word. Yes, you do. <laughs> all right, I'm ready. And so mine is all about voting. Please be sure that you not only vote, but you get the vote out in your neighborhood. Get your, get your neighborhood voting. Thank you so much. Thank you for all being here tonight. We appreciate it. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night.